Welcome to AEDT 4120, Serious Gaming and Simulations. Week 10, Instructional Design, video clip 3 of 3. I'm Professor Bill Kapralos, and over the next few minutes, we will be discussing effective instructional design features. However, prior to doing so, here's the list of analysis questions for this particular video clip. Number 1, what are the 10 effective instructional design features identified by Eisenberg et al. in 2005? Number two, what are the additional four instructional design features described by Cook et al. in 2012? A note before we begin our discussion, we will be focusing on medical simulation and the simulations may not necessarily be in the virtual domain. That is, they may be physical based simulations. Regardless, what will be presented here can be generalized. According to Cook et al. 2012, Previous reviews of the medical simulation literature have confirmed that technology-enhanced simulation, in comparison with no intervention, that is, no simulation, is associated with large positive effects. However, the relative merits of different simulation interventions remain unknown. Since the advantages of one simulator over another are context-specific, that is, a given simulator may be more or less effective depending on the instructional objectives and educational context. It makes sense to focus on the instructional design features that define effective simulation training, the open quote, active ingredients or mechanisms, end quote. Eisenberg et al. 2005 conducted a study that involved an extensive and thorough literature review and synthesis of the existing evidence in educational science to address the question, open quote, what are the features and uses of high fidelity medical simulation that lead to most effective learning, close quote. The aim was to perform, open quote, the most thorough literature review search possible of peer-reviewed publications in addition to reports in the unpublished literature, end quote. Searching through five databases, they initially found a pool of 670 journal articles, but focused this down to 109 articles. Here we will review the 10 essential features. The description provided here is a condensed version of what appears in Eisenberg et al. 2005. Note that the study focused on simulation for medical education purposes, and therefore some of what is described here will reference medical-based simulation. Furthermore, you will notice the term high fidelity. For our purposes here, high fidelity denotes a simulation that closely reflects the real world. Number one, feedback. Knowledge of results of one's performance is the single most important feature of simulation-based medical education toward the goal of effective learning. Educational feedback also appears to slow the decay of acquired skills and allows learners to self-assess and monitor their progress towards skill acquisition and maintenance. Sources of feedback may either be built in to a simulator, given by an instructor in real time during educational sessions, or provided post hoc by viewing a recording of the simulation-based activity. Number two, repetitive practice. Opportunity for learners to engage in focused, Repetitive practice, where the intent is skill improvement, is a basic learning feature of high-fidelity medical simulations. Repetitive practice involves intense and repetitive learner engagement in a focused, controlled domain. Skill repetition in practice sessions gives learners opportunities to correct errors, polish their performance, and make skill demonstration effortless and automatic. Outcomes of repetitive practice include skill acquisition in shorter time periods than exposure to routine ward work and transfer of skilled behavior from simulator settings to patient care settings. Number three, curriculum integration. Simulation-based education should not be an extraordinary activity, but must be grounded in the ways learner performance is evaluated and should be built into the learner's normal training schedule. Number four, range of difficulty level. Effective learning is enhanced when the learners have opportunities to engage in practice of medical skills across a wide range of difficulty levels. Trainees begin at basic skill levels, demonstrate performance mastery against objective criteria and standards, 
and proceed to training at progressively higher difficulty levels. Each learner will have a different learning curve in terms of shape and acceleration, although long-run learning outcomes measured objectively should be identical. Number five, multiple learning strategies. The adaptability of high fidelity medical simulations to multiple learning strategies is both a feature and a use of the educational devices. Multiple learning strategies include, but are not limited to instructor-centered education involving either A, large groups, for example, lectures, B, small groups, for example, tutorials, C, small group independent learning without an instructor, and D, individual independent learning. Of course, optimal use of high fidelity simulations in such different learning situations depends on the educational objectives being addressed and the extent of prior learning among the trainees. The rule of thumb is that one's educational tools should match one's educational goals. Number six, capture clinical variation. High fidelity medical simulations that can capture or represent a wide variety of patient problems or conditions are obviously more useful than simulations having a narrow patient range. Simulations capable of sampling from a broad universe of patient demographics, pathologies, and responses to treatment can increase the number and variety of patients that learners encounter. Number seven, controlled environment. In a controlled clinical environment, learners can make, detect, and correct patient care errors or switch out adverse consequences while instructors can focus on learners, not patients. High fidelity simulations are ideal for work in controlled, forgiving environments in contrast with the uncontrolled character of most patient care settings. Education in a controlled environment allows instructors and learners to focus on teachable moments without distraction and take full advantage of learning opportunities. This also reflects a clinical and educational culture focused on ethical training involving learners and patients. Number eight, individualized learning. The opportunity for learners to have reproducible, standardized educational experiences where they are active participants, not passive bystanders, is an important quality of the use of high fidelity medical simulations. This means that learning experiences can be individualized for learners, adapted to one's unique learning needs. Simulations allow complex clinical tasks to be broken down into their component parts for educational mastery in sequence at variable rates. Learners can take responsibility for their own educational progress within the limits of curriculum governance. The goal of uniform educational outcomes, despite different rates of learner educational progress, can be achieved with individualized learning using high fidelity medical simulations. Number nine, defined outcomes or benchmarks. In addition to individualized learning in a controlled educational environment, high fidelity medical simulations can feature clearly defined outcomes or benchmarks for learner achievement. These are plain goals with tangible objective measures. Learners are more likely to master key skills if the outcomes are defined and appropriate for their level of learning. Number 10, simulator validity. There are many types of educational validity, both in the presentation of learning materials and events and in measuring educational outcomes. In this case, validity means the degree of realism or fidelity the simulator provides as an approximation to complex clinical situations, principles, and tasks. High simulator validity is essential to help learners increase their visual, spatial, perceptual skills and to sharpen their responses to critical incidents. Clinical learners prefer this realism, face validity, with opportunities for hands-on experience. Concurrent validity is frequently considered to be the generalizability of simulation-based clinical learning to real patient care settings. A similar review by Cook et al. 2012 expanded upon the study by Eisenberg et al. 2005. Cook et al. selected eight of the features identified by Eisenberg et al. 2005 and added four additional features. Number one, cognitive interactivity. Training that promotes learners' cognitive engagement using strategies such as multiple repetitions, feedback, task variation, or intentional task sequencing. Number two, 
distributing training across multiple sessions, training spread over a period of time. Number three, group versus independent practice, training activities involving two or more learners as compared with training alone. Number four, time spent learning. Here we have examined two studies that performed an exhaustive review of the existing simulation-based literature to define a list of effective instructional design features. The two studies we just examined were specific to medical education, but they should not in any way deter you from their generalizability. In my opinion, they apply to simulations and games in general. Although there is plenty of overlap between the results of the two studies, there are some differences. Why is this so? Furthermore, although the studies do not mention serious games or game-based learning, there is no reason why these results can't be applied to serious games. Finally, keep in mind that according to the authors of both studies, greater work remains, so this is, of course, not definitive. There are undoubtedly other effective features that may be just as effective, but for whatever reason did not make the reviews. This brings us to the end of our discussion on effective features. And I just want to point out the references. First, Cook et al. in 2012. And second, Eisenberg et al. in 2005. This brings us to our list of analysis questions. Number one, for each of the 10 features identified by Eisenberg et al. 2005, and the four additional features identified by Cook et al. 2012, describe how they are applicable to a serious game in general. Are they all applicable? Do we need high fidelity serious games? Number two, does simply ensuring that any serious game or simulation developed includes all of the effective features imply an effective serious game or simulation? This is the end of this video clip. Thank you.